So, um, this year's topic of Oslo International Acting Festival is the polyvocal actor. Uh, the term we have borrowed, actually we stole it because we didn't even ask, uh, from Paul Castanio's uh, publication, New Playwriting Strategies. It's this book here. Um, here in this book, he uh, uh, used the term polyvocal playwriting. Uh, Castanio's book uh, is both uh, a theoretical work, uh, trying to describe contemporary playwriting, um, but also a pedagogical handbook, giving you exercises and proposals how to write new drama. Castanio seems to advocate for a shift of focus in American playwriting, from building on a strong Aristotelic tradition uh, with focus on plot and main character, today's playwriting, Castanio uh, claims, um, seems to be more about language. Uh, there can be a multitude of voices or, and styles within the play. Uh, the play writers seem to stick less with younger expectations. Uh, and we cannot expect to find a main character in the place anymore. The, this book was first published in 2001, uh, and then there came a new edition, second edition, in 2012, which is this one. Um, it has had a major impact on a new generation of American playwriters, and more and more people outside of USA also start to uh, deal with the book and use it actively in their work. Um, Paul uh, Castanio is now a professor uh, and dram uh, in playwriting and dramatic literature at University North Carolina, Wilmington. But now he's with us here in Oslo. Welcome, Paul Castanio. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hostin. Delighted to be here. Great. I'm so sorry. We have the best summer since 1947, uh, uh, and we have to drag you in a black box. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, the weather's been amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, first of all, uh, there, there has been a strong tradition of writing uh, books and giving workshops uh, on how to make a script in America. Yeah. Um, both uh, Robert McKee and Sid Field, which I assume a lot of you have heard about, uh, has had a major influence on the whole Western world's thinking of uh, dramatic writing, especially film. Mm -hmm. um, why do you guys tend to be Americans? <laughs> I think, well, film, uh, you know, is uh, a commercial enterprise in America, right? And uh, over the years, there's been a kind of um, idea about how a Hollywood film is made, um, which might be different in, in many ways than the European tradition of filmmaking. So that it, it follows a certain scheme, in, if you will, you know, in terms of plot points and so on. There's like, for example, the 17 minute moment. If you go into a, a screenplay about 17 minutes, you're going to find some kind of major inciting incident in which the, uh, you know, in which the action takes off where the hero goes on the journey. It's the idea that's centered around a hero's journey, going through a series of obstacles uh, and setbacks, ultimately achieving uh, or not achieving the goal. Uh, so it's, in a sense, uh, it's, a, it's a highly structured format that um, is coded in, in Hollywood, in a sense, in terms of how, how scripts are manufactured and what scripts are going to be produced. So a producer is looking for those, those kind of things to be happening in a script. You, page through them quickly to see what's going on. And, and then if those things are happening uh, in a successful way and the story is interesting in the, in the character development, uh, then, you know, then the, the chances of it getting greenlit and, and, and being produced are much better. Um, so, I mean, Sid Field is one you mentioned, uh, Ed McKay and so forth. Uh, so this is, uh, I think it's a little bit different though than from, from what's happening in playwriting. However, I think both of those approaches like, uh, 
Serkin and, and various others were talking about uh, uh, an Aristotelian approach, really. Um, you know, the, the things that you were talking about before, uh, that uh, these, the basis of most uh, screenwriting texts and, and playwriting texts is, is based on the Arist Aristotelian model of narrative, a, st a strong plot, a forward-moving plot, a hero, uh, a major character, and, and then bulking traits within a character that are consistent and so forth, and then setting the play up with obstacles. Traditional, traditionally, as you know, as actors, you're working with intention and you're working with obstacle and so forth uh, in terms of creating a character. So in many ways, the screenwriting and um, actor training are hand in glove in terms, of, in terms of what the expectations are and so forth. So I think that's, that's part of it. Um, and you can make a lot of money, uh, too. So, I mean, there's, there's that factor as well, so. Yeah. Um, but somehow, uh, this tradition, you, 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 I, th I think we probably agree that you uh, uh, have, are something else than this tradition of, of film uh, thinking based uh, playwriting. But um, uh, how, did it, uh, how, di how did you start the work with uh, the book? What initiated you to, to, to... Well, it goes back, actually, it goes back to uh, January of 89. I know it sets my age back a little bit, but... Things were happening in the 80s and 90s in America that there was a big shift in, in how playwriting was being uh, generated, if you will. And what was happening, there was a conference held in Key West, which is uh, uh, the southernmost part of um, Florida down there um, in January of 89. And they were looking forward to the new millennium, you know, 2000, what was, what was playwriting going to be like in the next 10 years? And there were two camps. And the one camp you had with, were the realists. Uh, you had... Uh, you know, Wendy Wasserstein, you had uh, uh, John Guerra, sort of a Lan Lanford Wilson people. And then on the other hand, you had these playwrights who were very experimental, uh, who I write about in the first edition in particular, Len Jenkin and uh, Connie Cogden, uh, Mac Wellman and so on, uh, who were very much anti this idea of realism, this, this theater of good intentions, that theater had to be have some kind of a sense of, of, of making a a better or p more positive statement, and really wanted to take uh, playwriting in a different direction in which language became sort of the arbiter of the mise-en-scene, that is, language was the producer of what would be, we'd see on stage. And this, this struck me as, uh, as a, very interesting, um, a very interesting strategy. And what, so what I did, I was running a program at the time in Alabama where I had a significant amount of resources to bring writers in, and what I did was bring a number of writers in for development of their work uh, during the 90s. Uh, so they, these guys and women would come down, um, uh, Len Jenkin in particular, Mac Wellman, and um, Eric Overmeyer, who ended up uh, writing The Wire and, and became a, a major uh, television uh, proponent of this type of writing, uh, would come down and develop their work. And they love Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa is a very sleepy town in the south, Alabama, and I know it has a uh, certain context in terms of its, you know, racial background and so forth. Um, but at the time, uh, they were trying, Alabama was trying to purport a more of a, um, a progressive message, I guess you might say. And so there was a lot of support for this. So we, they'd come down and people loved it because it was different from New York, obviously, kind of a sleepy sound, you know, very sultry southern town. They would work on their work. So over the, over the course of 10 years, I worked with a bunch of playwrights. And... Um, and then we would get together at the conference and said, somebody said to me, the first guy who writes the book on the new player is going to make a million dollars. So I said, I didn't make a million dollars, I'll tell you. But uh, so I said, well, I've I'll, I'll, got to be the guy to do this, you know. And it's a hard thing to write because they're, they're disparate um, voices. You know, they're not, it's not like you can lock everybody into uh, one style, for example. Yeah. Each one of these writers is writing in their own unique voice. Um, but using multiple voices in a way of uh, combining the text, uh, using multiple genres. Here we talk about the polyvocality aspect of it, where uh, a text seems like a convergence of different voices and so forth. So, versus so it seems uh, it's a consequence of the dramatic writing that you're dealing with the time yes. at the time and trying to kind of frame it, trying to say something about what is going on. Exactly. Um, the term polyvocality, since we are also talking about it here in the festival and the, the way we wrap it, 
Um, how do you define that term in your book? Well, polyvocality, um, I know it, it's not as complicated as it sounds, I don't think. I mean, it's, it's the idea, for example, that um, some writers were pulling found text, that is, taking text from other sources and putting it into their plays, and having characters interface, uh, like uh, this creating a sense of clash, a frisson, if you will, uh, with, the, uh, with their own writing and then the, the writing from a found text. At other times, uh, there would be this, I talk about in the book, things like scas, where you have a, uh, um, a character simply improvising, maybe in another language, for example, and that would go into, a te uh, go into the text. You have um, the idea of, of multiple narrators. So nobody has, nobody's point of view is, in essence, the primary point of view. And sometimes the points of view are different. Uh, you'll have things in the text that contradict other things in the text. Uh, this creates a convergence of voices and thoughts, or genres for that matter. So, um, for example, in a recent, uh, recent play, um, I saw I ended up writing about straight white men by uh, uh, young Jean Lee, you, you think it starts off as realism. You think you're in an you know, American canon play, you know, where it's, uh, the American dream is going to be something that's investigated, like a lot of American plays are like that. But then all of a sudden, the actors uh, become frantic. They have like wrestling matches, kind of like big time wrestling, so they mimic that form. And then they go into a song and dance parody, and then they're dancing all over the couches and jumping and doing leaps and that sort of thing. All this stuff happening in split second turns. Um, that's breaking up the form. So you, the realistic form that is being, um, if you would, it's, it's not being compromised so much as being uh, amplified by a number of different, uh, different dramaturgical strategies, if you will. So you have all these different dramaturgies happening within a play, creating a convergence. And at the end of it, it's like, okay, so what's all add up to? Um, in a traditional American dream play, you know, like from Miller or Williams, so you, you have this kind of arc that goes on. And, and th in this type of writing, the arc is always being subverted by different uh, types of strategies and different... Uh, for example, you know, guys in their 40s, and 50s, they're not, not going to be acting, acting out and, uh, like doing a wrestling match on stage. They're not going to be jumping into kick dancing and doing this sort of thing. So, you can uh, try. Oh, we can do it. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's, a, that's an example. Uh, there are numerous, uh, uh, Mac, like Mac Wellman started creating his own language. The other thing is like using bad syntax, you know, um, so that you, you kind of confuse the writer, but theatrically it creates a certain interest. Um, so there's an attractor in the text. So the, tra the, 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 the text is creating an attraction but it's not one that's based in a, a, a kind of narrative through line. You use uh, uh, you know, some, some terms which uh, I, um, is very clarifying for me. For instance, you use some kind of, you, you create these opposite terms, dichotomies, like uh, you talking about uh, traditional monologic play, mm -hmm. as you call it, versus what you call dialogic play. Right. I think we even have an um, image of, of uh, we have a list. Can we have the picture here? Yes, this one. Yeah, there you go. So uh, in the book, I try to set up these, um, these comparisons or contrasts, so it gives you an idea, a scheme, if you will, that uh, allows you to kind of grasp what, what these terms mean. In other words, dialogism, dialogism is the interactive me mechanism in polyvocality. But polyvocality really defines that you have multiple voices and dramaturgies in a play text, okay? And dialogism uh, is how they all work together. That's how they interact and where they interact. So that the playwright becomes an orchestrator of the text as much as, say, you know, the auteur or the author of the text. So uh, the places the author is the only creator here. In dialogues, you, you may pull from other sources. You may pull, you know, it could, nowadays it could be from tweet. It could be from, um, you know, things, things in the media. Um, it, it, can, it can involve audience interaction. Um, oftentimes, if, for example, like, like if you go down to the bottom where it says monologue can be dialogic, there's a lot of monologue in, in this new kind of writing, and monologue, but monologue that's not so much introspective 
as in a character's epiphany at that major moment in the play, but rather interactive with the audience, or interactive, in a sense, with the self, where the character uh, themselves is changing identities or moving fluidly between uh, various identities. Um, some of the other things here, um, this idea that uh, multiple points of view, I mean, you mentioned Bakhtin. Well, Bakhtin talks about that within the novel, you'll have multiple, uh, multiple voices instead of uh, the one voice of the playwright. In play development in America, historically, um, you know, if you got sent your play to a development place and you were going to get developed, you're going to develop your work, the idea would be your voice, you, you would be like, you're like the king. The playwright is sort of like the god in a way in the theater, right? So nobody can change a word, nobody can do anything to your play unless you, you resolve it. In this kind of, in this kind of writing, um, oftentimes you're working like with actors to develop work. And so that you become almost the transcriber, you know. I mentioned Young Jean Lee, for example, she did this play with African American uh, uh, actors, a uh, company. And she acted kind of as a transcriptor, transcriber and, in terms of orchestrating, even the straight women working with, with white guys, straight white guys, to try to get it because she felt as the other, you know, she had to kind of collide with these other voices. It wasn't something that just came out of her. Or, you know, the idea of a playwright working solo. So a lot of this, uh, a lot of the, this idea of polyvocality has to do with this kind of interaction, you, you'll find it in the EU collective plays, for example, you have multiple writers uh, working together, but not in, not with the idea of trying to create a, a homogeneous kind of play, like if you were, you know, you're working on a, a television script where you're writing by committee, this is the idea that the individual voice has its own resonance, or the individual style, and then you, then the, the, the play itself becomes a combination and collision of various styles. So actually we can, think about different way of thinking about art, like is this art doing a monologue just talking to you, or is it talking with the audience or with itself somehow? But this, uh, uh, the way you use a lot of terms differs a bit from a classical uh, Aristotelic or yeah. American uh, tradition. Um, for instance, you, you use the term beat which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, it very often describes a minor shift in the script or on stage in the attention of the actor or, or the character's wants or the energy of the scene. Right. But you have a little bit different take on the term beat. I Can do. I yeah, something the, the about beat, that? Yeah, the beat is the shifter. In other words, you could do a split. I think I have, we have a slide on yeah. that too, but the, the, the idea that the beat... Um, for example, the, yeah, I think the first, first one there is kind of interesting. If you take um, the beat, like if you're an actor, right, and you're working on a script, you, you know, uh, for example, I just directed Hedda Gabler. Uh, you know, it was a relatively traditional production in a sense, right, where the actor has to go through a series of beats, and it's, each scene is, is a build, and the intentions come, and then there's a transition. And so that shift in beat is a shift an intention for the actor, or the, you, you can play it either in terms of intention or you can play it in terms of obstacles so the actor can play. You know, if the, if the actor is saying, I love you, the actor can, intention may be, I hate you, you know, which is uh, the opposite. So you can, you can have this tension in the beat. In, in, the, uh, in the new playwriting, what we found was that the, the beat was a shift, or in other words, it could shift to another type of dramaturgy. It could shift to a whole other improvisation, or the actor could... Um, could be riffing. Uh, one of the things, the exercise we do is riffing where, where uh, the act, uh, the language just kind of takes off on its own, if you will. Um, and so the actor flows with that. It may change, uh, for example, an acting style. It may change a, a presentational style and how the actor performs it. So the actor is able to shift. The actor really becomes the, uh, the, the cog in the shift between beats so that the, the actor's whole performance style or the way the, it, is pro, it is progressed. For example, one might go from a kabuki style of acting to a, a normative realistic style, but what happened in a, in, a, in, a, in a moment, you see. So beats can represent shifts in dramaturgies. Um, and so uh, it opens up the idea of what, what the beat is. But it also, I think, gives the idea that the beat is something that uh, 
you know, can be interpreted, because you're talking about polyvocal acting. You know, how can the actor switch on a dime uh, into a different type of performance style? And so this is what, what, what we're, uh, we're describing in many ways with that. So this formal theatricality, uh, sort of, uh, yes. is, is both for, this, for the way of writing, but also for the way of playing. Well, I agree. Acting. I agree, because in, in the new writing, what we found was that, or what you would find, is that the language is more theatrical. The, the idea of, in a traditional play, you know, you're stressing the dramatic form. In, in this uh, type of theater, you can stress theatricality. You know, it could be an actor putting on a mask. Um, there's an actor maybe g going into doing something, a minstrel. Uh, an actor uh, becoming a con, pu putting on a facade. Uh, th there's multiple layers uh, that the actor can shift, f shift through. I call it, in the book, I call it faceting. You're talking about that uh, um, uh, the language of the character is not forcingly a consequence or a trait of the character, but that language in itself is creating character. Exactly. Um, could you say something more? You, you, here you also have some terms, you, you, something that you call traditional character versus what you call a multivocal character. I think we have uh, one image of, of, of there, this as well. Can you... Elaborate about this? Well, the big bit? thing here is like, uh, and that number one, um, for example, when I, I mentioned play development, so if you go into, uh, you're working with a dramaturg in American uh, playwriting development, you're the O'Neill Center, or you're working at Playwright Center in Minneapolis, one of these d development havens, okay? So what's gonna happen is you'll be, you know, be assigned a dramaturg, and the dramaturg will say, okay, well, you know, this character, we're trying to get what's the realm of that character's speech? So each character has a kind of specific dialogue or a specific way of speaking. In the new writing, uh, the, the, the idea that a, a character could have many, multiple levels of speech, for example, one, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be based on class or, or race or any one of these uh, basically uh, predictors, if you will, of speech. So um, the, the actor can switch you know, it can go from a high, a high form of level of language to something that is, um, you know, very, very uh, much, it could be slang, for example, or speak in foreignisms, or, um, or use uh, bad grammar going from high tone to low tone, very, very back, back and forth, if you will, quick switches in terms of language strategies. Um, or speak uh, in, in a more literary way. It, it has, it has uh, uh, a number of applications, whereas in character specific, normally the idea would be kind of normalize the language so that, so that we can identify the character with its, within a socio class, if you will. The other thing I'll talk about is the saturated bio, um, which I don't have here, but I, I, I'll bring this up in the workshop, is that um, in, in most play development, or even, you, I use it when I'm directing, but you hand out a saturated bio, which is all the backstory of the character, right? So that you have a sheet. So if you're acting, let's say you're developing a character in a traditional play, then you, t you take this saturated bio, which has, every, it has your age, uh, things you like, religious beliefs, um, you know, uh, tra traumatic things that happen to you, libido charge, all these various things, and then you, you make a measurement how, how those are important to your character. It helps you define you know, where the character is in the place. So you, have a, you develop a kind of three-dimensional mentality in, in that. And that's, that's part of what this character specific is, is that you have um, this idea of backstory is very, very important. Um, in the, in what we find in, uh, in this non-traditional writing is no, no character backstory on it. It's, it's simply the language as it is. It's not something where the, we want to flesh out a character through going into the, 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 you know, what happened to them before the play, you know, what was their parent parental relationship, all the fictional world that, uh, that the actor would bring to it or, or bulk into uh, creating a part. You give a lot of exercises in a book <coughs> in order to kind of develop uh, language uh, and, and how to we deal with language. Could you give some examples of this? Uh, yeah, well, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, well, for example, uh, one, of the, one of the, like in the polyvocal, it starts off, I, I separate the two terms, polyvocality and multivocality. 
Uh, the polyvocal has to do with the text itself. In other words, how the, 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 the whole uh, construction of the text. Usually, um, these re result in what we call a hybrid, and hybrid is being um, a crossbreed of, of multiple dramaturgies, if you will, as opposed to, say, realism or melodrama or grand guignol or whatever it might be. You're going to have multiple uh, dramaturgical strategies. Multivocal would deal with uh, uh, characters having um, various speech strategies within a play or working on, on different types. So one of the things I do is riffing. You know, you take a word and riff on it and see where it takes, takes the play. Um, characters uh, take a word, almost like a jazz, uh, like you think about in jazz, you know, like an improvisation, if you will. So then the, the writer works with this, but the, through the permutation of riffing, finds some kind of, um, you know, a deeper connection to the story or a deeper connection to their character. But it's through language they find it versus something psychological or something that they're emoting or feeling. I think it's in, in The Wire where there is this scene where there are two or three characters and the only word they say, it's a scene of four or five minutes, I think, where the only yeah. word they say is fuck. Yeah. And they say it over and over again. Is this yeah. some sort of way of thinking about language as well? Yeah, I think there's a thing in the book there about fuck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, just one, it's just one monologue where the f I, I point out that fuck means about 12 different things in the, in the monologue, right? It's so just the way, the intention of it saying. The other thing is intonation, right? Intonation is, that's an actor thing, intonation. Okay, intonation is how how you project it or how you would say a particular word. So in riffing, it'll, it gives the actor flexibility in terms of how they say the word or, or what part of the word they focus on and concentrate on, you know, that, that can foreground a certain meaning, uh, meaning for the audience. Um, but it allows the actor a lot more play in, in terms of what, uh, um, you know, how they want to deal with it in the moment. Uh, and then there are, I mean, there are a lot of exercises in it. I mean, there's, um, like I have this exercise. One, one of the things that was, was big in the 90s, a, call, a thing called nouning, where um, playwrights would just combine, uh, com combine like strings of nouns and phrases. And, and then you, you, when you read it, when you look at, look at it, you go, you know, what the heck is this? I mean, <laughs> it doesn't. But by putting intention in it, by, by the, the way the actor would present it, it it imbues meaning for the audience. It's like, uh, it's like writing a play without characters, but then the, as an audience member, you create a character. So the audience is creating the character based on, uh, based on the language strategy, you see? And it's interesting because you don't even have to have character names, but the, so it's how an audience will assume, you know, just like you and I, if we were reading, so you're gonna assume something about our characters just by our presence in, you know, our voices, what we look like, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, those kinds of strategies are, 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 are in there. There's uh, another one, another, others has to how, like, um, like Charles Mee, who takes classical texts and, and re-adapts them, you know. Um, and he has, for example, a website. You can go in and he says, mess around with my plays. So that, that's this idea. You see, he, you, he does a, a classical play. Big Love was one of his, where he combines various classical texts, but also um, there's a lot of modern tropes in it. And then at the end of it, he says, if you want to take this play, do it, and you can rewrite whatever you want, do whatever you want with it, which is basically kind of a multivocal or polyvocal strategy as well. So uh, the idea of adaptation of classical text by bringing in modern characters, working with uh, characters across periods, for example. Uh, most of your references uh, are American when you talk about uh, <coughs> contemporary playwriting. Uh, I guess we are all familiar more or less with uh, the classics like Clifford Odets and Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams um, and their realistic styles more or less uh, and bringing problems of classes or society on stage. Uh, but I think probably fewer knows um, Susan Laurie Parks, Lynn Nottage, or Sarah Rule, which is which you are using as examples yeah. uh, very often in your book. Can you can you say something general about these uh, play writers? Yeah, I can. I mean, I, I would say this. Okay, so uh, in the first book, which came out in 2001, actually came out right at around 9/11, which was very 
provocative in and of itself. But uh, between 2001 and uh, 2012 or so, when the second edition came out, um, what happened was a number of the writers who had been I'd written about became heads of programs, like graduate programs at NYU and Yale and so forth. So they, they spawned like a whole new generation, mostly of women and minority playwrights, actually. So uh, the first group was largely white guys, you know, and I mean, some women certainly, but by the time you get to the second generation of what I write about in here, many of these women, when I, and so I, I, I added this chapter called Crossover Poetics, and that is what, they, what we found was that in, in the regional theaters in uh, America, you know, to get produced, you want a semblance of realism, but then they would explode the realism with, um, with these experimental techniques. So you have this, what I call crossover, because it purports to be realism. In, in other words, it gives the audience the comfort of that they're in a, kind of a realistic world, but then it expands and, 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 and sort of blows it up, either with multiple narrators and, and Sarah Rule. I mean, Sarah Rule, uh, for example, are, are anyone familiar with her? Yeah, she, she wrote the, um, she's written a number of plays. Um, the Vibrator play was a big one about um, sexual frustration in the 19th century, you know. Uh, but it's, it's almost Ibsenesque, you know, in, in having that 19th century vibe, but it's about the first vibrator, you know. So this, this guy, has, his, his wife is frigid, and so this vibrator becomes this big thing, and you can hear they're outside the door, you know, hearing the vibrator. But there's also male nudity in it. So you wouldn't have male nudity in, uh, you know, like a 19th century Ibsen play, you wouldn't see this. But. So there, there's a combination of the old and the new in, in, in her, her work. Um, Susan Laurie Parks is, is dealing a lot with issues within the black community. Top Dog, Underdog was her most famous play. But in that play, for example, it's, uh, you know, two black brothers who are uh, named Lincoln and Booth. But they also have this con going on with the, the three-card Monty game. So it, it moves from this, what, one of the things you can talk about in polyvocal uh, acting is just the performative acting. So the actor not only is acting as the character, but then is performing as you know, the con artist who's playing cards on the street. So you're, you're getting those kinds of things. It seems like uh, uh, a lot of what you describe as, or big parts of what you describe as polyvocal playwriting also have given voice to black communities. Uh, black Many of your examples are black women. Um, how is this tendencies being, how, how, what happened after Trump with this kind of playwriting? Yeah, everything's changing after Trump. Uh, not for the better, I might add. <laughs> uh, be happy you're not living in America right now. It's not really that, it's, you know, scary place kind of really. Uh, but Trump, um, uh, right now, okay, I think there's been a change in America. Because, uh, uh, for example, last well, in April, I was at the Humana F Festival of New Plays, which is the major American festival for new work. And most of the plays were dealing with issues that are going on right now in, in the culture, like immigration, for example, you know, um, the exploitation of immigrants. But it's problematic in that um, they, aren't, they aren't, say, bleeding heart plays or plays with a real agenda. They're just kind of presenting these issues. Another one is, uh, you know, the Me Too stuff, uh, with, uh, which has become big uh, after Harvey Weinstein and all the, the thing about, um, you know, uh, sexual kinds of uh, harassment of women. So plays that are dealing with these kinds of issues, but using uh, these techniques, some of these, these new techniques, so that they're not that it's not traditional realism anymore. There's also senses where uh, characters are, actors are playing multiple characters and switching gender. Um, you know, so there's the issue of, of transgender characters and so on. It's almost as though the, that uh, if you look at it um, in 2016, for example, 2016, 2017, 16 of the top 20 plays being produced were written by women or minorities or dealt with diversity issues, okay? So there's a preponderance that theater in the age of Trump has to be very kind of committed in a way to, to dealing um, with, with reckoning with society and some of the problems that we're facing in America right now. 
Is it the danger that uh, plays start to be like political and didactic? Yeah, well, it's always a problem. Uh, yeah, exactly. But th I don't think they are. I no? mean, it's, it's not so much preaching to the converted, you know. Yeah. It's uh, more um, like this one play about an immigrant who was abused uh, by the banker, the French banker, who, who was going to become the president. I'm, you probably remember that story. And she was raped. Uh, but she had the opportunity to, to, to basically s speak to this woman who was a reporter in the play, and she re rejected it because the settlement had given her a restaurant in New York, which was allowing her to make a living. She didn't want to stir it up anymore, you know? So, I mean, ultimately, um, it's, we're, seeing, we're seeing more of how, how compromises are being made and how things are, are playing out um, without it being so much that, that it's, the story is being told with, either with a happy ending or, or, or a sense of didacticism. Um, I, I wonder if uh, this way of talking and thinking about play with polyvocality, with uh, giving different voices that say different things in different language forms, etc., cetera, um, if, if this is really something new, or is it a new way of looking at plays? I mean, we can take Shakespeare is even doing gender cross-dressing yeah. quite regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is it the way we read and think about the play which is new, or is it actually a new way of writing? Well, I think the, the dramaturgies are different, you know. I, I mean, I, I agree that, I mean, Shakespeare, uh, the, what, uh, uh, contamina con contaminatio, you know, the idea of, the rhetorics of taking texts from different sources, which he did, combining it and then making it, making it his own statement. I mean, that's, that was Shakespeare's way of working, certainly. Um, but He didn't invent very many plots. Yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> and then you have, a, you, know, you have different c characters deriving from Commedia dell'arte, for example, Polonius yeah. coming out of uh, Pantalone. You see, uh, you know, the advisor, consigliere, you know. So you have, yeah, you have these, he's drawing on what's, what's the sources from around him. I think the difference is that um, the, the experimentation in, in, the, in the writing here is, is being more allowing the dramaturgies to speak on its own rather than trying to blend the dramaturgies into kind of a synthesis, you see. So I think that's, that's more allowing uh, multiple characters to, to speak or to take over a play, like this idea. I talk about this in the, in the, in the play, the pivot monologue, where you, one of the big things in traditional playwriting is like, whose play is it? You know, what's the play centered around? You know, like Hedda Gabler's about Hedda Gabler, you know, and, uh, you know, you take Death of a Salesman is about Willie Loman, but now in the middle of the play, you know, Sarah Rule is, for example, uh, in Dead Man's Cell Phone, you have, it's the story of Jean, the, the woman, and it's, a, it's a tracing this nice romantic comedy arc, but all of a sudden then in the second act, uh, the dead man comes in with this big long monologue and kind of takes over the play, so it, it challenges whose play is it. And, and that's, that's kind of something we, we didn't see, we never saw that kind of thing before. Hmm. So there's, there's challenging, uh, it's almost like the form, if you will, um, is, is wanting to challenge uh, versus, versus uh, putting things in more acceptable forms or forms that uh, audiences may already be familiar with. Hmm. There's so much to talk about, and uh, it's a lot of new ideas that we are throwing on you, and we know. Uh, we're going to dig more into it during the week and be more concrete and give examples and also talk about the consequences for acting, how we're going to deal with this situation. Um, but I, I, I just want to uh, open up for questions or comments or whatever. I'm sure somebody has al many questions, too many maybe, but... Uh, are there anybody? Yeah? Just when listening to you, I'm starting to like figure out what you're talking about. And I sort of think about um, painting and that type of art form, where there has been also a search for the truth. So that you uh, the believe that if you picture something realistically, you will get the truth. And many of the place also has done this that when you and the, the way the actors are that if we can uh, portray something very realistically 
then it is the truth. The realism but, is truth. Yeah. The, but, uh, this idea. Yeah, and now we've, I think we're sort of in a place where uh, the realism has, uh, it doesn't cover all the um, aspects of us, of our reality. So we sort of need to see all the truth, truths in one. We need to see all the possibilities to recognize ourselves. Because when you portray one thing as the truth, then you uh, lose all the other truths. And also because, as a woman, I see this also from the feminine perspective, that it has been a man's world and a man's truths. And when women start to make their stories and try to use the same formula, like the hero going out on a journey, it's just like copying the same, but it's not really uh, a form that can show different truths, different aspects. Maybe you can be a hero without going to be very heroically. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I, uh, this, this last year, uh, um, LGBT woman from Australia wrote me a uh, that she was doing a dissertation and that the book had opened her idea of multiple voices because uh, she was dealing uh, with this character who has issues um, with her father-in-law from an Arab country and, and their understanding uh, you know, of her sexuality, that they couldn't, they couldn't deal with it and so on. But she was able to create these, these, this idea of multivocality uh, in these characters um, to express that's a good point because within the uh, you know hegemony of the sort of the the, the American dream play, um, it doesn't fit. I mean, a wo woman's realities often don't fit in that in that same category. Uh, and and in, in a number of, of plays by women, there are multiple you know women and, and, and women dealing with uh, their lives in a, in a much different way. So um, I've been satisfied that this has offered some other ways, uh, you know, an, an other uh, to give voice. In that, in that sense. Does it mean that uh, polyquality somehow is a break with a realistic tradition of a mimetic tradition? I think so, yeah. yeah? yeah I think it's a break, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Great. Somebody else that uh, have any comments or yes? I'm curious about the necessity of this uh, new path. Is it is it uh, um, uh, is it a step on the journey to finding a new uh, way of writing? Is it uh, a new and what are the effects of the of this uh, new form? If I, if I can call it that. Um, yeah, I'm someone who feels like good traditional theater is enough. Do we need something else in good traditional? Theory? No, we do because I mean, uh, well, millennials. I mean, many of you are millennials, right? So, uh, it's, you know, like for example, uh, if you're familiar with Punch Drunk or something, you know, like in, uh, we're doing these performances in uh, London. I saw about three or four years ago, um, attracting a whole new audience. Um, I think it's it's important for theater to attract a new audiences who don't who can't resonate with the same stories, you know, from, from the past. And so I think that this kind of writing, uh, and it can evolve. In other words, it's, it's not like it's, it's anything that's set in stone. It, however, it's, it's appealing to an audience that's looking for something different. It's um, an audience that's feeling that these, the traditional forms, of this woman pointed out, um, realism don't, do, doesn't quite grasp what's happening in society or, or grasp in the, in, in the multi locality of your lives. I mean, even in terms of how people present themselves on Facebook, I know Facebook is being, has been really problematized because of its, um, the sense of, if you talk about realism, then you realize that things are coming in that have, aren't, aren't even real at all. These bots, for example, things that are just being produced. Or identities can be produced that are false identities. Or people can have identities that are, for example, not, uh, or only showing one part of themselves. That kind of thing. So, I think th that the new forms are allowing new voices to express themselves that, in ways that the old, you know, the old forms weren't able to. That's right. For, for now. Still pondering. Yeah. Yeah. Still pondering. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> oh, we're completely open for a discussion here. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So uh, the language you were talking about, language of uh, language strategy. 
um, can you apply it in a film or it's more in the theatre? And if it's applyable in the film, how does it work? How could you comment about that? Does it apply for the movies as well? Well, you know, describing? I mean, uh, you know, Tarantino <laughs> used these strategies in dialogue. I mean, if you listen to his dialogue, for example, the characters, like in Pulp Fiction, for example, will kind of go off the rails. They'll start talking about things that, that stretch the idea of what character-specific dialogue would be. And he just takes, takes them off. They'll be talking about art, or they'll be talking philosophically, um, so that you have the idea, uh, his idea of character um, is, and dialogue, for example, is, is to kind of let the dialogue go, is to, is to allow the characters to riff, riff, riff on it without it necessarily having much to do with the action at the time, but it becomes a thing in and of itself. So the language um, in, in a lot of his work, it gives him that unique, that, that unique, unique And there are monologues, I would say, that somehow, uh, uh, that the character seems to know things that is, is not kind of in, in line with the character in the rest of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. You, al you are also mentioning, um, uh, if I remember correctly, you were mentioning The Wire, Deadwood, and Mad Men as mm. examples of these tendencies. Maybe you can give some of these examples? As well. Yeah, I mean, uh, in The Wire, uh, Obermeyer, actually, I work with him. He, he's the one first one who started. He did this uh, play called um, On the Verge, uh, which was about in the late 80s. It got done a lot in college campuses because it had three women who were trekkers, like in the 19th century. And I uh, used thought, wow, you know, I'm just sitting back. I'm watching this comfortable play about the, these kind of single women out there foraging ahead. And then all of a sudden, um, you get into act two, and they, they start being advanced in time, and they, they come up with objects that they have no way of defining. They don't know what they are. And so they, they imbue them with, with all kinds of um, talismanic qualities. They might be from the gods and so forth. But audiences got really upset because you know, all of a sudden, they, he, he had thrown them a curve and, uh, and put these women in a situation which was unfamiliar, this idea of defamiliarization, which is something that is uh, again, part of it, um, particularly, it, it was a big part in the 90s, I think, the, the idea that uh, when the making strange, if you will, so that something, a, a common object or prop w would be very strange for somebody in the 19th century if it was something that had come, like a telephone or something, or, or a, a radio from the 20th century. So this, uh, this was it. And then he, he has this concept in The Wire of, it's, it's like a Baroque concept where you have three or four different storylines going on at once, and then they're interweaving and converging. This juxtaposition of storylines. So in the wire, he had the, you know, he had the cops, he had the, the the drug guys on the street, and then he had the politicians, and how they, these stories would weave and mesh, and creating this kind of a, a Baroque structure, if you will. How is uh, Mad Men uh, a language-based uh, series? Well, I think it. it, it it locked it, it locked it in its time through the use of language and the, the, the phraseology, for example. Mm. It captured the, the language uh, in a kind of cant, if you will. Uh, it, in other words, the same with Deadwood. They, it created a world based on language that wasn't a traditional Western or so, but it created a, this sense, uh, sensibility within the language. It's like it created its own language it's in, in, in which the characters inhabit this, this language field. Yeah. Do you have one last small question before we send you out for a lunch break? Yes? Hey, um, so uh, I recently saw this play, Ufo Bygda. Um, wow. <laughs> it's in Finland, and I was just curious, um, I'm talking about this, uh, where you would place that in, um, in this You're asking me. Yeah, I'm asking you. You can just explain something about it if you wanted to. It was about uh, uh, what is the play about? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a play about the light phenomena in a small village uh, up uh, in Norway, and we made a play based on this phenomena, and we interviewed uh, a lot of people. We saw the light ourselves. Spectacular. Oh, yeah. Really yeah. spectacular yeah. phenomena. Yeah. So it's like UFO, <laughs> I think. Yeah. 
Uh, and then we interviewed, uh, then, we, then we met a lot of people believing in UFOs and having instant telepathic contact with, uh, with extraterrestrials on other planets. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, and we were even in a UFO church that claimed that Buddha and Jesus is living on Venus and uh, that <laughs> they are continue to give new gospels and, uh, and, speak, and, and speak to them. No, so, but we, we, we can't, I, I think, uh, I don't know what you would say, but we had the actors sitting there and they were giving all this material, acting themselves, talking mm -hmm. to the audience, mm -hmm. uh, proposing to the audience to come with their stories and, and sharing their stories and sharing their research. Yeah. Yeah. And some things were they quoted directly from the um, interviews, mm -hmm. like there were the people they interviewed, right, right. and sometimes they were just talking about their own experiences. Is it, does it sound like a yeah. polyvocal kind of yeah. play? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> it's polyvocal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you also the, because I saw your hand was... Uh, um, yeah, I, I was just uh, curious in general about these new plays you talk about being written in this uh, festival and, and things like that because uh, I mean I hear you talking and you talk about a, a lot about this this polyvocal coming because the realism is not enough and what is what is real and what is not real and uh, Westworld and what is our humanity and these uh, identities being created that turn out to be fake identities and for me it just sounds like some sort of uh, existential crisis going on in this in this uh, atmosphere so i'm wondering if if there there is coming any new plays that just uh, go back to this like absurd form of writing where where there is no meaning in the play uh, uh, do you see any new any new uh, plays coming that just reject completely finding any meaning yeah. yeah, this is very interesting. Yeah, yeah I do. Is uh, it a symptom of that we don't have any truth? What What is going on? No, I mean, I think Mac Wallman's plays are like that. I mean, some of them are. Um, uh, especially his later ones. I mean, you know, Max, a lot of people say he's not crazy. He's just crazy. I mean, but you go to, you go, they're, they're entertaining shows, but it's, it's just what it is. It's an existential experience without it trying to, you know, amount to some uh, deeper screed. I mean, he, he's very uh, apprehensive that, you know, that the theater can become like te teleological or, or make some grand statement, you know, that we can all feel good about. It's, his stuff is, it's just weird. And so you are like, whoa, whoa you know, what is that? <laughs> you know? But theatrically, it's fun. You see, it's fun. And it's, and, and I think that would be, uh, you know, something that's closer to absurd. Like, for example, he'll, he'll have uh, characters that are holes. Well, okay, so if I tell you, like, you're the director, right? you got three holes. I mean, so how are you going to cast a hole? You know what I mean? <laughs> what are you, you going to do about that? Or this character has a shadow that won't... Uh, I know Fosse does that, too, with, with a shadow character. So, I mean, you have the idea of a shadow, right? Okay, and the shadow is, like, lurking around, but... I mean, so you got to cast a shadow, okay? So, I mean, those kinds of absurdities, right? Uh, but then they're they're also ontological because you th there is a sense of the thing being there. It's just uh, how can the actor f formulate it, uh, you know, to create that entity? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely you're, you're, there's one aspect of this whole range. This is, by the way, a continuum, okay? This is not just one thing. It's a broad continuum, and that's why I said even some of it leaning more a combination towards realism, others much more towards the abstract. Okay, so you have this almost like a panoply um, uh, in which in, in which this uh, which, which these new forms are operating. Okay, till now. We'll continue with that uh, later as well. Yeah. I think this is also very interesting and important, this feeling of, of relativism or, or what do we have now or what mm -hmm. is our coordinates. And I think also this is a big reason why we do have this festival, because we also don't know. And we would like to try to find out. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, have a nice lunch and uh, good workshops, everybody. And I'll see you here tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you, Paul. Thank you.